Uh, yeah, so go to therealronmiscavige.com and you can see how you can become a Patreon by contributing anywhere from two to whatever you want, maybe 50 or or $100. And uh, it, it is a way to help us continue this show. And if you don't want to do it, that's totally okay. But I appreciate your help if you do it. Believe me, I do. And um, the other thing you can do, and that is this. If you could share this site with a lot of people that you know or that would be willing to look at it, I'd like to expand the membership here. Because the more people we get to be enlightened about this, the better off we're all going to be. So without much more words except from uh, Sean, my producer, what is going on, Sean? You're good. Okay, she's taking pictures of the screen. Yeah. Okay, you know, maybe he's going to sell them at a, a farmer's market or something. You know, pictures of his screen while an interview is going on. <laughs> Just kidding. Anyway, without any further words, please welcome my special guest. You all know her and you love her. Karen de la Courier. Good morning, Karen. Hi. 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 So it's your turn to talk. And <laughs> we have some interesting stuff to talk about today. And uh, I'd like to kick it off. Why don't you give it a little intro? Because you were talking to me about this before we went on the air. A, a little setup so people can know what we're getting into, okay? Yes. Well, I'm taking my lead from the Leah Remini show with Mike Rinder on the wonderful opening with Valerie and her escape story. And I thought it would be really good to cover a few thriller type escape stories or funny hilarious escape stories now ron let's just look at this for a second a church should be a sanctuary uh, a place to go to reach your higher self meditate have a communion with others but in scientology people plot and plan how to escape you knew Valerie, right? Oh, absolutely. I knew her when she was in a Seerg and she was a steward for David. And she, give me a, she escaped in the boot of a car. Isn't that risky? Well, you know, Karen, just let me interrupt for a second. You realize, and I'm sure most people out there listening to this realize, when you make a car and you have a trunk, you have to put a rubber seal around that trunk to keep the rain out when it rains. Mm. That also acts as a barrier to getting a lot of oxygen in that trunk. Mm. And, you know, these days when they mm. build cars, there is a, a trunk release inside the trunk. So you can't get trapped in a trunk. But I don't know if this car had that. <clears throat> but to lay in a trunk, I don't know how long the oxygen would last. Who knows? It may be a day or, you know, 12 hours or whatever it is. That's, that's pretty, pretty dangerous to, to do that. Yet she felt that she had to do something drastic because this was her last chance to go because the shoot, she was a talent coordinator. The shoot they were doing was the last one that they were going to have at Golden Era Productions in Hammett. Mm. And so at the moment, <clears throat> she came to this realization and thought, wait a minute. It's either now or never. So she grabbed a handful of jewelry that she had there and a couple of her belongings, went out to where the cars were parked, checked to see if any of the cars were opened. Fortunately, one was. She unhooked the trunk, crawled in it, and pulled it down on herself. And there we go. What, what extent do you go to to get away from something? What could be that bad? Well, I'll tell you what could be that bad the way people are treated on that base. And that's what led her to do it. Anyway, go ahead. She was in for, what, 27 years? She was a Sea Org member? I, either, Something like that? Yeah, I, I think it was. I, I thought it was 31, but maybe you're right. Maybe it was 27. She was a second generation born into yeah. it all. Yeah. So after 20, see, people have a threshold. Everyone has some limit. And, you know, Ron, I'm going to, uh, <laughs> I heard a lot of stories. I've never heard it from you directly, but I've heard stories that you and Becky very much planned your escape for six months. Now, Ron, this is what I, <laughs> you know, 
in the cult, you can be summoned to HCO, the ethics division, and police polycraft for what you've been thinking, what you've been plotting, what you've been saying. So there's a real danger to be plotting for a very long time. Can you tell your escape story? Well, I'll tell you a short version of it because I've, I've told it, I think, well, maybe not in great detail, but I have told it on a couple other shows. But I, I can tell you, before I get into the escape story, mm -hmm. let me put you in the type the state of mind that you'd be in prior to this or prior to kind of coming to your senses and saying to yourself, do I really want to live this way the rest of my life? I'll, I'll give you an example. I can remember doing a recording late at night, and this is on a studio we had on the north side of the property, and it was called the Mid Res, short for Middle Reservoir. And that used to be a place where there was water when the place was Gilman Hot Springs, which was a, a resort for people from Hollywood and, and Los Angeles. And, you know, very important people would go there for rest and relaxation. And they had hot springs there. But this studio was at the top of the hill and it was renovated. And there was a music recording studio put in there. And I can remember being so tired that I had to get some rest. And so did the other people. And we laid down on the carpet and covered ourselves up with sheets of insulation. Mm. Now, think about this. What would keep you working under those conditions? And I can tell you what it is. It's your intense desire to help other people. Because at the bottom of all this, the people who last actually think they're going to help every man, woman, and child on this planet to lead a better life if they can just disseminate this knowledge and get it out to everybody. And it is that, that you want to help people and you're willing to tolerate just about anything to continue working to do that. Now, just giving you that, I, I can tell you a little bit about the escape now. <clears throat> I started thinking about that escape years earlier because I saw the handwriting on the wall and I saw that the way things were going, they were going downhill. Life was getting harsher and harsher. Our liberties were taken away. Our freedoms were taken away. You know, just many people will, have, will tell you this and I'll tell you, you, your letters going out were, were screened by security guards. If there was something in there they didn't like, you had to rewrite it. You couldn't make a phone call without somebody listening in on the telephone. And my wife, Becky, found out by accident that all of these calls, the telephone switchboard operator would listen in on it and write a little piece of paper saying who you called and what you talked about. And that would go in a file. I mean, Jesus. This is like, like 1984, you know, this uh, Big Brother stuff. Anyway. That's how it came to me that something going in a given direction has momentum. And that momentum is going to carry it further and further in that direction. In other words, if something is going bad, it isn't going to stop and all of a sudden say, oh, we're going to do the opposite. We're going to do something good. I saw that this was happening and I saw as bad as it was, it was going to get worse. And I used to talk to Becky about this as, listen, Beck, one of these days, we have to make a move to get out of here. This is not a way to live. And uh, she is the eternal optimist. She says, Ron, I know it's going to get better. I know it's going to get better. Well, it came to a breaking point. And one day I said to her, Becky, look, we got to get the hell out of here. She says, okay, let's do it. Now, this took place, our plan, over about six months. And during that time, she had been going in for interrogation for something she said that then the, the ethics section thought what she said was something that was counterproductive to what we're trying to do. So they, they took her in for this in, in interrogation and it went on week after week after week. She was getting this all the time we were planning our escape. And fortunately, she never leaked out anything, which I give her credit for, you know. So during that time, 
one of the things that happened was this. My wife told my daughters that they should give me 75 gifts for my, excuse me, 76 gifts for my birthday. Now, this came in about six boxes, you know, little things like maybe a pen or some uh, dry erase pencils or various little ad administration things and some other nice gifts. We use that as a template for getting our stuff out of there because then the guards saw that we were getting all these gifts. We said, we're going to send out so many gifts to Becky's mother to reciprocate this with somebody else. Mm -hmm. So what we started doing was sending out our books, our var various other things that we didn't want to leave behind. And it would go through security because they thought, well, since it was done for me, I'm doing it for somebody else. Mm -hmm. So that's how we got a lot of our stuff out of there because when you're living on, uh, 50 bucks a week and you got about 46 and change you what you have is pretty valuable to you at that point anyway because you don't think you know how the hell am I going to replace all this stuff you don't think that far ahead that when you get out you're gonna you're gonna be more prosperous and get a job and life is going to be a lot easier and you're going to become more affluent at what you're doing so anyway that's how we got a lot, a lot of stuff out of there and then one of the other things and it was a major part of our escape was this I had to set it up so that when we left, it would be something that I could just, you know, go out the gate and nobody would say anything. What would I do? Well, here's what I did. I lived on what's called the south side of the property. And there was a road dividing the south from the north side. And there were two gates. There was a main booth gate. And then there was a gate down the road. It was called the west gate. Every Sunday morning at nine o'clock, I would drive through that remote gate or the west gate across to the upper side of the property because our music studio was there where I worked and the music studio had a refrigerator. We couldn't keep refrigerators in our birthing area. And I kept various like Italian salami, super sat, Parmesan cheese, Romano cheese, a lot of goodies. And I would go there and I'd take some and go through the main booth and I'd give some of this to the guards every week. Mm -hmm. So they got totally acclimated to me going across the road, coming back through the main gate and getting these treats. That was the setup. Mm -hmm. Now, after getting all these things sent out, we then planned on a particular date, which was March 25th in 2012. Well, that, came, that day came, and I got up around 7 in the morning. This is two hours earlier than I had to be up. And I had a little notebook. I still have that notebook of all the things we were taking, all the things we were just going to discard and let behind. Part of that, the night before, I was throwing a mesh bag full of shoes into the back of my car, and a security guard came down on his bicycle. His name was Sal, good friend of mine. And he talked to me as I was loading the car, but he never for one second expected that this was getting set up for me to leave because two reasons. This was my biggest cover. I was 76 years old and nobody would say, hey, this guy's going to get out of here. He's 76 years old. What the hell is he going to do? OK. And I was the father of the chairman of the board. So the, any suspicion they had, they just washed out of their lives. Also, and the guy by the name of Norm Starkey, who was a longtime Sea Org member, came by because our apartment or our living space was right across from the laundry room where you'd go and pick up towels and sheets and everything. And Norm came walking by and he said, Hey, Ronnie, how's it doing? How are you going? I said, Oh, it's going great, Norm. And meanwhile, I'm loading in another bag of stuff. Nothing. Next morning we get up nine o'clock. I drive down the road. I see that the security guard who's uh, there's two security guards. One is at the main booth and one is, uh, what they call a chase car. And the I, I knew that this would be the case because you have to eat. And when we went past our place where we ate, I saw the chase car there. So I knew that Sal was in having breakfast. And I knew that I had enough time to pull off what I wanted to do. I come to the gate and truthfully, that was a moment for me because I figured if he says come up to the main booth, we're screwed. We're locked up. We're getting interrogated. 
who knows how long, months, maybe years, but I figured I would never get out. Came to the booth, pressed the button, and you there's a TV camera there. The guard saw it was me. He pressed the button. The gate opened up. I slowly exited the gate, and I said to Becky, we're turning left, Becky. She said, let's go. I turned left, jumped on the throttle, got it up to maybe 70 or 80, where I got down to an intersection where you, if you went right, you went up to Route 10, which went to Los Angeles. If you went straight, you went to Route 60, which went to Los Angeles. If you turned left, you'd go into town. Mm -hmm. And I figured no matter what, once Sal gets on the road to chase after me, I've already made this move. I turned left to go into town because I, I knew that he would think I either went to 10 or to 60, and I'm sure that's the direction he went. We went into town, got there down the road, maybe in a minute to get to the stoplight. I turned into a country road and we were free. And that's that's how we escaped. And we drove across the nation uh, two and a half days to get to Wisconsin where I eventually, you know, I'm, that's where I'm living right now. And we paid everything cash. We didn't use my credit card. I had a credit card. And the reason we had to do that is because if you use your credit card, they have all kinds of intel going on. They would find out where you used it and they would send somebody out on a plane to get you and seize you and bring you back. Yeah. So all the gas, all of our motel expenses, we slept two nights in a motel, uh, food, all cash. Mm -hmm. So that was it. That's how I escaped. And, uh, there's a short version of the story. You never looked back. That was four years ago, five years ago. Right? Well, that was 2012. So that, uh, six years ago, six years ago. Yep. Wow. And uh, I'm happy to say that my life is so much different. It's almost inconceivable that I would have done that for 26 and a half years. Okay. But not inconceivable because why did I do it? Because I thought I was helping people. Why am I doing this podcast? Because I, I am helping people. I'm getting them enlightened. I'm getting them aware of not only the Church of Scientology, but cults in general, because the people who I have on are very knowledgeable who have experienced many cases, similar things to me. So this is done in the spirit of help. As a matter of fact, I'll tell you what, I'm going to take five seconds. We're going to start. I'm going to start a new religion today. Okay. <laughs> Here we go. There are two rules and only two rules. Number one, help something. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, what, let's say your house is getting a little bit, dilapidated looking maybe you need a new paint job paint the house help it help it to survive you know and uh, i know it's only a material thing but a, a nice paint job on something or go get your car washed did any of you ever experience when you hit a car wash sometimes it feels like it drives better you're kind of helping the car or feed the birds put some bird food out or you know put some food out for the ants <laughs> help something and number two help somebody and it could be the most simple thing in the world it could be what boy scouts did when they were little they vowed to do a good deed every day they'd help somebody an older person get across the street or something but they did a good deed they helped somebody somebody's needs somebody to talk to lend them an ear if you see somebody who's a little bit down and out maybe they give you help give them some money and i'm going to tell you this you're going to feel better doing that than helping yourself i swear to god so those are the two rules, help something and help somebody. And if you aspire to do this, go ahead. There's no other rules than that. And we should call ourselves something. I don't know what it would be, maybe universalist or something. But <laughs> there you go. This is the start of a new religion. I'm not looking for a tax break. I'm not looking to get rich, but I am looking to change the minds of a lot of people to go on a little bit of a journey of helping other people and feeling better themselves. And maybe those people can join and they can become part of our religion. So there you go. There, we just started a new religion. Two rules, help something, help somebody. Very good. Okay. And you're, you're witness to it. You're my, you're my witness, Karen. <laughs> I am your witness. I am Do I have a witness? You know, people hooked up with compulsions on massive amounts of drugs and alcohol. If only they knew the secret 
instead of just pumping their own body with another drug or whatever, if they would go out and just help, yeah. go to a soup kitchen, see what it's like to feed a homeless person. Yeah. Go, 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 go feed some pigeons, go throw some, just helping someone external to self actually lifts morale. I, I know the value of help. I think it's like magic almost, you know that? Yes. yes. I mean, every time I do something like that, anytime I'll donate maybe to, I support, well, not support, but I send money to the Milwaukee Rescue Mission on a regular basis, and I give them donations of clothes and stuff. Here's an outfit that all they do is help people, but yes. they don't just feed them. They have two floors in a huge building where they have training centers, and people go, go there, homeless people. They teach them a trade. So now when they leave there, they can get, take some clothes from the donations that people give and they can go out dressed up and get a job. And while they're getting on their feet, they have very, very, very inexpensive birthings like bedrooms and stuff where they can stay until they're on their feet enough to get their own apartment and fend for themselves. It, it's a fabulous thing to see. And I, I just enjoy their going there and saying hello to them when I'm taking, you know, clothes donations and stuff. So I, from my own experience, I feel that that's, that's the way to go. And um, there you go. Give a man a fish, he will eat for a day. Teach a man how to fish, he will eat for a lifetime. You got it. And you can still retain your belief, whether you're a Catholic, whether you're Jewish, mm -hmm. Protestant, or anything. And this could be something that you would do personally. Okay, it, it's not something to get you away from what you're believing in right now. But the simplest things, help something, help somebody. Anyway, I don't want to beat this to death, but th there it is in a nutshell. Over to you, Karen. Well, um, I want to tell you a kind of hilarious story of a Sea Org member who was a security guard at the HGB, the Hollywood Guarantee Building, middle management. Right on Ivar and Hollywood Boulevard. And he badly wanted out. He saw this was just, they were locking people up in the basement. He saw the darker, the dark secret places inside. When you're HCO, HCO is the ethics division of the cult. But he knew that if he dared to say he wanted to leave, he would be put on hard manual labor and sort of siphoned off, segregated from the rest. Of the, it's, a, it's a crime. You're treated like a common criminal if you ask to leave. So he came up with an ingenious idea. He put on full Sea Org uniform. You know, his, his Sea Org cap and the- right, Class A, Class A uniform. Yes. And in Hollywood Boulevard, some years ago, about three, four doors down, there was uh, a sort of go-go lap dance place where you could go in and get a woman to sit on your lap and thrust her body into you, simulating sex. So in full Sea Org uniform, he goes to the place, he gets a lap dance in uniform, and then he comes back and quacks about it and tells. <laughs> and, and it was interesting because they, they were incredulous. They said, you did that in uniform? It was almost like if he did it when he was in civilian clothes, bad boy, but in uniform, Sea Org uniform, the elitist, that uniform was in a go-go bar getting a lap dance. So long story short, they offloaded him in 24 hours. Mission accomplished. His ticket he didn't to freedom. <laughs> <laughs> How desperate can you get? There's an example. <laughs> now I, I can flip and tell you another short story of, of a woman who, she came from a family with a lot of money. So she's talked into going to flag Clearwater facility, but they don't have her confessional folders, like all her history. 
and she waits and she waits and she waits for a week. Meanwhile, every sales agent called registrar is hitting on her. And she has a week of people just beating up on her for money. And she's calling her husband and complaining every day, every day. This is not a church. This is a runaway money extortion racket. So her husband is sick of hearing these complaints. And he says, you know what? Get out of there. Just go. Go to Tampa Airport. I'll have a one-way ticket all prepaid ready for you. Go. And she said, well, yeah, but <laughs> my designer clothes are at the sandcastle and my and makeup. Leave your designer clothes. Get in a taxi. Go to Tampa Airport. So she thinks, well, they can ship my things later. So she she's fearful. There are security guards. She comes out onto Fort Harrison Avenue, and as luck would have it, a yellow cab is just cruising, and she yells, taxi, taxi. Now, this, you know, it was just sheer luck. This is not Manhattan with a yellow cab every five seconds pulling. It was just right. luck. She jumps in the cab, and she says, Tampa Airport. Now, she has nothing on her. No, no, no belongings, no suitcase, nothing. And the driver, he turns around and says, you, you want to pick up your luggage at a hotel on first? No, no, Tampa Airport, go! <laughs> and the taxi driver lifts his head out of the window and looks up and he sees the Ford Harrison and he goes, Ah! Tampa Airport, no luggage! Church of Scientology! <laughs> <laughs> he knew! Unbelievable. That when people are escaping Church of Scientology, it's Tampa Airport, no luggage, go! Wow. <laughs> that was a public trying to escape because even that you can be held against will. I've known people book an airfare seven times and had to cancel because you're held. Mm -hmm. Wow. Yep. Escape stories are, are a lot of fun. What about your escape story on the girl who the girl who did that purchase? The what now? Remember the girl who did a purchase of you were telling me about a girl who went and bought a sexual oh, I don't know, that's that's a bit south. I don't know if I want to get into that. Oh, now. okay. Okay, fair enough. It, it's just you know, people will resort to things that I don't know. You know, if, if it, 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 you you would understand how bad it can get in the resort that you would go to 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 get out of there, but that well, that one is over the edge. I got to tell okay. you, Karen. You were at in base that long. If somebody at in base right now stripped off all their clothes and walked naked across the base, would they not be kicked out of the base? off immediately would they not i'm I, i'm but wait a minute i didn't get the question karen for some reason uh, you broke up there okay. if, if somebody at the in base walked where with their uh, clothes off if they walk to you can't escape in base because of the security guards right but say they stripped naked and started walking around on the base with no clothes on would they not be considered crazy and be given a free ticket to maybe maybe because i'll tell you this if they suspected they were doing it just to get out of there mm -hmm. they still might be held against their will that, that's these security guards who do this they're they're hip to any type of uh, little acts that people can put on but on something like that let's say if you walked out into the road naked you know yeah yeah you'd say okay you're, you're uh, a security threat to this base and they could get out that way mm. but it doesn't have to be that how about mark headley how about his escape mm. i mean he he got out on a motorcycle mm. went down the road mm. they saw him going down the road and they sent a chase car after him and they drove him off the road mm. where his bike went into a ditch and he couldn't get it started and fortunately 
well, not fortunately yet, but there was people in the car. They were trying to talk him into getting in the car. And then I think there was a police car that came by and said, what's happening here? And at that point, uh, they saw the car with the Scientologists in from the base and they knew it was happening. So they offered the help warrant. They took him and they took him into the police station. Um, and then after he told his story, they took him to a, uh, a U-Haul where he got a truck and I think he put his motorcycle in the truck and drove off that way. They actually assisted him in escape. And that was uh, in his book. He tells it in detail, which it's a great story. And uh, of course, then he got his wife out, Claire Headley. And now they're living in Colorado. He's a very successful man. He does uh, audio visual systems from, for different uh, companies like the hall of fame. He put in all the audio visual for I think the NFL Hall of Fame and this place down in uh, uh, where they have the country Western stuff. He, he's done it all over the United States. And here was a guy joined the Sea Org when he was 16 years old, got to the point where he just couldn't tolerate it anymore. The suppression was just unbelievable, made his move and he's very successful now. And I'll tell you this, the people I know who have left are succeeding in life. They're not flipping burgers at McDonald's the way, and there's nothing wrong with that the person who has that job, but that's what the security guards used to tell people. If you leave here, you're going to end up flipping burgers and living under a, a tunnel or something, which you, you're never right if you want to leave. The, the, the cult is always right. You're wrong. And uh, after you leave, they say, well, we're glad to get rid of them. They don't like to admit that you escaped successfully. So, for good reasons. So then they'll start saying, well, he was no good to begin with. And that's where we got rid of him. But you know what? I, I think, you know what I'd like to do? I'd like to get into some of the basics of, you know, the, the, the cults. I mean, like the leaders and, and how these things are put together to keep you in. You, you want to get into that, Karen? Yeah. Um, interestingly, they've got this hate propaganda site called Stan or Stan. And they just got this whole, <laughs> I should have sent it to you. They're denying they're a cult. They've got the word cult. And then they've got a definition of a cult. And then they're denying and proving that they are not a cult and that they are a religion. So this word cult associated with them is getting in their head because they're coming forth on their site to argue or debate about it. And yeah. Emphatically deny it. The word cult is very much associated with Scientology, starting off with the absolute authoritarian dictatorship of the top of the food chain. Right. Earlier it was Hubbard, now it is your son, David Miscavige. And his word is law. It is law. It, it is so much law, it trumps the laws of the land. In other words, if the top of the food chain asks you to do something illegal, remember how David Miscavige asked Marty Rathbun to destroy Lisa McPherson's evidence of yeah. her last few days of life? Well, yep. Marty, Mis Marty Rathbun destroyed valuable evidence on the death of Lisa because he was ordered to. So a cult believes they are supreme, senior to any laws of man. And other religions say that we only obey the laws of God. We don't obey the laws of man. Other, other, other churches have said that, but yeah. in Scientology, they take it to a whole new level where internal molestations, even rapes and, you know, assault and battery and kidnap and locked in, locked in cellars and locked in rooms and holding someone hostage against their will is a felon. And it's done every day of the year in the cult. Yep. It's in, in fact, it's normal if someone is locked up and segregated People just consider, well, he's done some bad things or he's a, oh, they think he's a threat. They have every right to lock him up. He's threatening 
us. He's threatening the life of Scientology. So yes, the, the, the belief, I wonder why humans need to have a Messiah, to have someone, some of these horror stories of the church of FLDS where Warren Jeffs, a, a convicted pedophile, is still running the outfit. Yeah. From jail as a pedophile. He's still the leader and he's still loved and adored as the Messiah. You know, now, yeah. You, you brought up an interesting point. And let me just throw two cents in. This could be worth no sense, but it's two cents. And I'll tell you what. As a matter of fact, as we were talking and the last few days, I've been thinking about this exact point. You realize when man was at a lower stage of development, coming along the way of evolution, you know, I mean, let's face it, people in the 10th century, if you were to take them and if you could take a person out of that time span and put them right in present time and show them automobiles and uh, in, uh, the Internet and airplanes, he'd be astonished. He just couldn't believe that another man could conceive this. So the people in those days would attribute things that they didn't understand to a higher power. Mm. Do you see what I'm saying? Mm. And I think this became part of man's DNA early on, not just recently, but very early on, thousands and thousands of years ago. Whereas if they, you know, saw an eclipse, which we can explain that thoroughly these days. They would say this is God's way of telling us something. We don't know what it is, but it's a God. It's a higher power doing this. And I think somehow that's retained someplace in man's maybe subconscious mind that there's always something that you can appeal to or maybe you get punished by, which is a higher power. So somebody comes along with the idea that sounds great. He's a charismatic speaker and he represents himself as a representative of God, this may be one of the reasons why people would look up to a guy like that. You see That's what I'm a tactic. That's a tactic used by rogue leaders, that they have this secret, secret, direct line to God. Yeah. Always, always. For example, David Miscavige had that line to Hubbard. Right. And he, nobody knew what Hubbard had sent down through Pat Broker to. So he had this mysterious direct line to Hubbard. And then after Hubbard died, he had access to certain Hubbard advices. And da, 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 da. there was always, uh, always, always um, an insinuation that he knew a lot more because he was connected to higher authority yeah and people would swallow all this as some some special blessing he had yeah i, I think you're right i think that that's what they do and then they get the flower the followers brainwashed and um these followers will follow the leader and it's done on a regular basis and it probably, in, well, not probably, it, in the very beginning, it is not done with any duress. It's done as a relaxed way to get people to agree to things, simple things to agree to, to get the hooks in. And you agree that, well, communication is good to know. It's good to be able to communicate better. You can get better along with people. Uh, you, different ways to carry out your job. You know, make sure that when you're doing a job, you get everything done before you go on to the next thing. Very little simple things that, you know, you could find in a little self-help book. And these are laid in and they're laid as a groundwork for further things that then, because you got this initial data that helped you, you accept these things further on up the line without questioning it. Now, once you can get to the point where you'll accept things without questioning it, then you are a true follower and you, you're, you're molded into what they'd like you to be. They mold your mind, they brainwash your mind, 
but it, and then it's done on a constant basis. Like in Scientology, you have to go to study for two and a half hours a day, five days a week. And in that time, you're actually studying L. Ron Hubbard and you're brainwashing yourself. Yeah. You see what I'm saying? I mean, it's, it's yeah. brilliant. You know, it's brilliant in its macabre way, you know? Yeah. A cult is very, very strong on indoctrination. And how dare you think for yourself or question any of it? Yep. Questioning puts you in a category of being a heretic or an apostate. You must blindly be in the tunnel, swallowing every word. And even though you kind of dimly realize something's wrong, something is wrong. You may not be able to put your finger on the pulse of what is wrong, but many people know something is wrong. Some things people keep leaving, people keep fleeing. Uh, ethics keeps being harsher and harsher, more and more discipline. Certain things are just wrong. Uh, one example is Hubbard has a lot of policy on the word exchange and how you must, you are only happy as a human being when you give due and proper exchange. Not just quid pro quo, but blue chip ex exchange in abundance, I think he calls it. Right. Blue chip exchange. Yet, a cult will have you slave for them for pennies an hour, just literally. Uh, there's no exchange for your, not even minimum wage, right? right. You, you're, 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 you're completely destitute, dependent on them for cents an hour. They may or may not give you medical or send you to some free county medical, but the exchange is really, really bad in a cult. Yeah, I, I agree. And the thing that you that makes you tolerate it, as far as I'm concerned, and this is my opinion here, and that we're talking about, not talking about like uh, factual, absolute, stone cold facts. My opinion, what keeps you there, is you think that what you're doing is helping mankind. So you're willing to tolerate it. You're, you're brainwashed into thinking this. <laughs> Helping mankind. Yeah. Well, yeah. Another thing about exchanges in the cult of Scientology, it's a pay as you go religion. Our every hour of service you pay. And the moment you run out of cash, boom, no more counseling. No, more. you pay as you go. Now, if they screw up and if the delivery of what they gave you was a dog's breakfast, as often happens, the person did not win. They did the wrong program. The auditor clashed with the, the counselor clashed with the public, this, that, anything can go wrong. There is no refund. Not only is there no refund, they make you pay again to handle the screw-up that they created in the first place. Any normal business, any corporation with integrity, if you buy an iPad or if you buy a laptop and it, it's manufacturing damage, you walk in immediately, they ship you another one. Yep. We, we just bought each other brand new state-of-the-art laptops. Jeffrey and me gave each other Christmas present of laptops. Dell delivered in 48 hours. One came in perfectly. The other one, FedEx damaged it and were so embarrassed at how much damage they did, they wouldn't deliver to us because uh, it was mangled. So they sent it back to Dell. We called up Dell and said, look, we're going out of town for Christmas and we've got to have that laptop. Boom! Within half an hour, Dell found out that FedEx sent back the bad laptop. Within half an hour, Dell had a new tracking number of the replacement laptop 
because it was bad service to not ship the laptop promptly. Uh, that's just an example, right? That, that's a good example, I'll tell you, because this is how successful business operate and businesses who operate that way succeed and they last. I got news for you. The Church of Scientology is in on the Titanic right now. They can say what the hell they want and they have enough money to keep the, the pumps going to pump water out. But uh, that's uh, they're they're going down. Ron, the, 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 when we talk about exchange, when the cult completely screws up and does something very bad in what you've paid hard cash for, they never remedy that ever on no. their own dime. Even that I know. It's what they call an overt product. You paid no money to fix what they screwed up in the first place. Yeah. There's, I know someone who went back 10 times, 10 times to Clearwater to fix L10. It so far cost him $250,000 quarter of a million dollars for one service and each time it got they were now fixing the screw up of the screw up of the screw up well look they promised on l10 you'd go exterior with full perception i was getting l10 with meryl mayo you mm. remember meryl i remember her well and we got to the end of it and i says well, I, I didn't go exterior with, with full perception i thought that's what i was going to get she said to me, well, we can try for it, but I've never gotten it on anybody I ever audited on L10. Absolute truth. The truth came I, out of her mouth just like that. I audited, I counseled, and case supervised L's for eight years, morning, noon, and night, for breakfast, for lunch, for dinner. The L's were my thing. Never in eight years of dealing with tens of thousands of people who did the procedure, nobody got that. Yeah. It's the fake, it's fake news, fake put out there to scam money in. Yep. Mm -hmm. Well, that's as far as exchange is concerned. And then, you know, they, well, I guess we took this up. I don't know if to get into it where they, uh, they use their troops, their their worker bees, to uh, the full extent for the least amount of money, and that that's the exchange with the people who work there, which is pretty goddamn bad because some people need medical care, they can't get it, or it's just they have to go to a clinic, and they're unwilling to really care for their people, and just it is. And you know, they're sort of shamed by the internet, but it became a thing where as soon as you got too old and you got medical conditions, you were shipped back to Canada or the United Kingdom because there's a national health service of free medical. They yeah. didn't want after using you for 20, 30 years, as soon as you became less vibrant, less able to work 60, 80 hour weeks, you were shipped back to your home country for them to pay the medical bills of the medical conditions yep. you now have. Oh yeah, I, I know that to be true. I know that one person I knew at the Gold Base, uh, Marco, uh, had cancer and they says, well, we want to ship him back to Italy so he can be with his folks, but they didn't want to pay for any treatment. So he went back and you get medical care in Italy and that that's how they handled him. You know, that's taking care of your people? I don't think so. You know, Ron, one, one, on one of these shows that I do with you, I want to discuss the whole thing of death and how sometimes the cult actually say, you know, go ahead and just drop your body, knock off your body. You're going to reincarnate. You're going to go, you know, you can go get a baby body. So just go, go on, die, die off now. Leave, leave your body. There's, there's, there's there's story. There's some real stories on death, and how the cult actually encourage you to just get the hell out of there, you know. And yeah. It's and yeah. There's there, there's some stories on, and I want to discuss that with you. Not to mention no, because we have grabbing your no. cell phone 
and that and what your son did if he dies that what your son did to you if he dies like so let's do that that'll be another that's yeah for a whole different let's do another one because we're not we don't have a ton of time left in this one okay. and i i, I want to explore some other things with it but i think that would be a great great uh, interview to to take up that would be good and we'll do it um now one other thing and I think this is prevalent in all cults. I can't say all for sure because I don't know everything about every cult, but the ones that I knew about it, one of the common denominators is this. The followers are never good enough. Mm. They never come up to the expectations that the cult leader puts on them. And it's done on purpose. It's the carrot before the donkey trick. You know, you put a rod on a donkey's back and hang a carrot and the donkey will walk forward thinking it's going to get the carrot and you'll never get it. And with the followers, I know at gold, we were golden air productions was by L Ron Hubbard considered to be the worst sea org organization ever in the history of the sea org. That's how they tabbed us. Now think about this. You go to work every day thinking I'm the worst group of people who's ever worked for the church of Scientology how am I going to get upgraded so I would be considered somebody worth uh, having the Sea Org uniform on or living up to the expectations? And there was no way to do it. No way. We were in a lower condition for a decade. Could not get out of it. Yet, if you're, when I say a lower condition, there are, there are formulas that they have in the Church of Scientology where if you're in a normal operating thing, there's steps you can do to raise yourself up into a little higher one. And if you're in a lower one, uh, maybe you're in treason to a group or, or you're, you're a liability. You can do steps that will raise you up. Doing these time after time after time after time never got upgraded. But the followers are never considered good enough. And I think it's prevalent in some other cults too. You know, let's look at the mentality for a quick second. I think the idea to humiliate, negate, belittle yeah. what you've just accomplished, I think the mentality behind that is if we squash him and tell him how that is just worthless, he's going to try higher and he's going to, uh, by punishing and negating what is achieved, the mentality is so screwed up upside down that they think that that's going to make the person have more energy to do better. And the reverse is true. When you validate goodness and you go, wow, you, you tried hard there. It actually, the reverse is true. A person tries harder with a little praise and they do it 180 degree down you dog. That sucks. That's a piece of rubbish thinking that that's going to energize you to be better, 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 it actually just squashes you. Now, could, squashes. could you imagine the state of mind that a person would be in to think this? <laughs> well, I can tell you this. From my opinion, I don't think they believe the words come out of their mouth, except they think this will keep them working harder. But you're right. If they were to say, hey, you guys are pretty goddamn good, you know, and that's well done. Here's a day off. Things would change for the better instantly. Oh, and by the way, Karen, you said a quick second. <laughs> That's a memorable way to put a short amount of time. I've never heard of a slow second. Maybe. <laughs> so here we go. That was a quick second on that. And you're right. I, I know in all the time I was there, I could never live up completely. Yeah, there were maybe one or two or three moments where we did as the musicians something good, but invariably shortly thereafter, we were then considered bad. We were counter countering everything that the chairman of the board wanted to do. We were trying to destroy what he's doing. We were never good enough. That That is a symptom of a cult, I think. And then. Uh, Ron, Ron, yep. now, now bookmark this. The one thing about a cult is the one thing about a cult is they want to find your evil. They've recruited you. They've sucked you in. They will move heaven and earth to not let you leave. But while you're there, 
you are this evil entity trying to destroy all of Scientology. I know. You are evil. You are harmful. You are committing overts. You are committing crimes. You've got evil in your soul. That's 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 worth a whole show. What the cult do to flush out your evil? Yeah. They want to exorcise the evil out of you. Well, you got a point. And, uh, you know, I'll tell you, people watching this, I, I wonder if they're thinking, could it be that bad? And the answer is no. It's it's worse than we're saying. And I know that's hard Actually to believe. We live it and walk in our shoes. Yeah. One, one day we calculated, I was in 40 years, you were in 42 years. So we okay. were in, we're talking from being, living, breathing all this for 82 years combined, yeah. correct? Yeah. Oh, yeah. And you know, Ron, I wanted it to work. I wanted it to be oh, true. I God wanted damn. it to I wanted it, so I stayed there. <laughs> I felt I felt exactly the same way. That was exactly what kept me there. I wanted this to work. I wanted to help my fellow man. And uh, it just it, it didn't work out. And when it came to the point where the curtain came aside and I saw the guy pulling the levers, you know, like in the Wizard of Oz, that, that Wizard of Oz, I knew that my time was limited and we had to get out of there. And that's when I said to Becky, hey, we're the hell out of here, you know. Well, all right. So, so right. Yeah, the last thing I just go on. I would say you have, you have a couple. Uh, so you had a couple of super chats. Um, Cynthia for three dollars said, thank you, Ron. And um, that's for your Christmas shopping. So there you go. Uh, oh, th thank you, Cynthia. Hey, Merry Christmas. Yeah. Red Scare says uh, amazing escape story. Thanks for sharing. And he actually just became a patron. Oh, good. Uh, for uh, two dollar patrons. So. And who is this now? Red Scare. Red Scare? Yeah. What a great handle. Red. <laughs> hey, my brother used to call me, my brother Red used to call me Sam. <laughs> <laughs> so the word Red always brings back fond memories of a great brother I had and and a nice time I had growing up as uh, him as an older brother. Anyway, thank you very much for becoming a patron. I And I also welcome you to my religion. Help something, help somebody. Wait a minute. Should we call it a religion or should we call it a group? I don't know. I don't know. Religion's kind of, I don't know. It has connotations that yeah. maybe I don't want to have. Okay. Right. We'll figure out what it is, but it is a group of people that have agreed to help something and help somebody. And I think, I think the more people we get doing this, and it's going to be easy to do because it's a natural proclivity of a man to help. Okay. Anyway, Sean, and then, and then Alice says, sending my love, Jodek. Always love Karen's episodes. So that's Alice. She was that, the, that's my uh, honorary granddaughter. Yeah, so, honorary granddaughter. And uh, she says, Jodek. That's how you say grandfather in Polish. Yeah. So I will say to you, Dziękuję, which means thank you in Polish. And I just want to make sure we mention Stephen Hutchian. He was the $100 patron. Oh, boy. I thought we mentioned that. Oh, maybe you did. I could have missed it. I'm sorry. I was messing around with the... No, well, I'll tell you, if we didn't, yes, yeah, Stephen Hutchinson is a $100 patron. And Stephen, I'm telling you, uh, he gave a little story about his experiences in Scientology. And I invited him to come on if you'd like to be a guest on this program and uh, tell his story. I think it's pretty interesting. And this is a public person. He wasn't on, oh, excuse me. No, he was on staff, wasn't he? Sounded like he was, yeah. Yeah. And this, this would be, you know, the invitation is there, buddy. So you know how to get in touch with me. Just go to. Uh, contact Ron. There's a number there you can call, and we we can get together and talk about it. All right, and don't be bashful. You know, don't don't, don't back off of doing something like that. You know, look at you become a patron for that much. That takes some balls to, to step forward for that much money, and I very much appreciate it. Um, and anything you can do to help, you're going to feel better. And you're right in line with uh, <laughs> my my new group. Like, I got to think of a word what we're going to call it, but the, our group of people help somebody help. Help something, help somebody. You're going to help a lot of people by telling your story because hopefully some of these people who may be on the cusp of trying, on, well, let me try it out, you know. Here, forewarn them. Let, let's tell them what they're going to experience. And it, it isn't good. Anyway, Sean, did you have something else to say on that? Okay, so Karen, mm -hmm. did you have anything else to say? Because I think we pretty much covered what we wanted to cover today, didn't we? Yeah, I think we did. And it opened up new things. Um, yeah. You know, 
I'd like to discuss how cults go for the evil in you and how they, how the Scientology cult once looks at the area of death. That, so on. that so is let's, good let's, because let's, that, let's that's never that. been taken up, I don't think. Okay. Correct. The subject of death. I know there's a lot to be said on it. I'm not going to say one word. I'm going to save that for you because you're my expert on this, Karen. <laughs> <laughs> so listen, from the, the end off with the last few words, uh, again, if you'd like to become a Patreon and become an actual participant in this kind of uh, journey we're going on to help people and expose this and enlighten people, uh, I welcome your help on it. And it's very much appreciated. And the other thing is, if you can get other people to watch our program, I'd also appreciate that. And uh, I welcome you to our new group, Help Something, Help Somebody. So until the next time, I'm Ron Miscavige. This is Life After Scientology. I will see you on the next episode.